Good morning, and thanks for tuning in to Harbor Cove Online. If you're checking us out for the first time, we want you to know that we also have two campuses in Gig Harbor that meet on Sunday mornings. You can check out our website, harborcove.church, for more information about who we are and what to expect if you join us in person. This morning, we're in our sermon series called Hello, My Name is Jesus. There's a lot of talk about who Jesus is and what he did and what he taught. So we want to spend some time listening to what Jesus says about himself. Whether you've been following Jesus for many years or don't know what you think about Jesus at all, let him introduce himself to you through his teachings. Today, we're focusing on something Jesus says in Matthew 11. Jesus has some strong words for people who refuse to be changed by the work that he's doing. So settle in. Our service is about to start. Get ready to worship, and thanks for joining us at Harbor Cove Online. Oh 
morning. Welcome to a church that loves Jesus. Welcome to a service that worships Jesus. Welcome to a community of people that are just trying to become more and more like Jesus. So I want to invite you now to read these words responsively with me. Come to worship Jesus, Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and is to come. We come to worship the one who rules the Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of this earth. Bread of heaven, God with us. Good shepherd, true vine. Eternal Word, Great I Am. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. We, we come, come to worship Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Sing it out to the King of all creation. The King of all creation set aside his crown. A servant to the Father's love descended from his throne above. Author of salvation, giver of new life. Crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness. from 1 Corinthians. It says this, 
Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live.
be seated. Let us pray. Lord, we are gathered today after a week of worship being apart. This past Sunday, we committed ourselves to the principles of compassion, mercy, and justice by supporting organizations in our community, whether sorting donations at the Habitat for Humanity store, building IKEA dressers at the Northwest Furniture Bank, or doing yard work as part of the Mustard Seed Project. We were working in our community, serving others, putting our faith into action. As we are encouraged in Matthew 5.16, we are to be performing good works with the desire that our good deeds would shine for others to see so that they will praise you as their Heavenly Father. Today we focus on your Great Commission. You commanded your disciples to commit their lives to spreading your word. It was your intent that they would evangelize and teach others to become followers and also be your disciples. But that Great Commission applies to all of us even today, nearly 2,000 years later. It's our duty to use everything in our power to also spread your word and teach others the importance of committing their lives to you and to you alone. But Lord, for us to do that well, we must first commit ourselves by giving you the authority to lead our lives. We pray that you enter our hearts and remain there, beating strongly, guiding every moment of our day. We pray that you guide our minds to be aligned with our hearts so that we are not selfish or self-centered. We pray that you give us the courage to allow your plan for us to unfold no matter where it leads. We pray that you give us the wisdom to make the right choices in difficult circumstances. We pray that you give us the will to be obedient to your word always, despite any temptation not to. We pray that you help us to love others even when it is difficult and we don't want to. We pray that you help us to be humble before you and never waver in our faith. So now let us pray together aloud the words of your prayer, which should ground us in that faith and love for you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Matt Knapp, and these are the three things you need to know this week. Number one, fall. It's that brief season where you cram as much pumpkin spice into things as you can before you hear all I want for Christmas in the grocery stores. Plus, football's back. The fall is filled with a lot of good things. And one of those things is the start of another season of ministry as a church family. Youth groups are starting, small groups are starting, service projects and supply drives are coming, and we each have new opportunities to live out our faith in our own contexts throughout the week. So to celebrate this, everyone is invited to our fall kickoff celebration next week. And I want you to remember this word, partner. In the fall, we believe that the more of us that partner together in ministry, the more reaching we can do for Christ, the more discipling we can do, and the more compassion, mercy, and justice seeking we can do as well. So this fall, you're also invited to partner with us in ministry. Join the hospitality team or the care team. Be a youth leader or a kids leader. Volunteer to serve with the Community and Schools Program or the Northwest Furniture Bank or any of our other signature ministries. Next week, we'll talk more about all of that, and after our worship services are done, we'll have a giant party at Central Campus. There will be free lunch, activities for kids with yard games, and a bounce house, and gaga ball, and go-karts, and special thank you gift bags for anyone who has volunteered this last year in any capacity. So we'll see you there. Number two, Mommy and Me. This is my mom. This is my kid's mom. This is my mom's mom. Moms are rad. They're so rad that we want to give younger moms time to connect with other young moms so that they have a support system of other great moms. I know I've said moms a lot, but young moms and their young kids are invited to come to Mommy and Me on Wednesday mornings at Central Campus starting next week. There are snacks and drinks, time to connect with your kids, and time to connect with other moms while we watch our kids. Now remember when I said that word for the fall was partner? To make our Mommy and Me program work, it needs some partners. 
We need help with the nursery and watching kids for part of the time. And we especially need someone who is gifted enough to lead a music time with moms and their kids. So if you're a young mom and looking for some community, you're invited to be a part of Mommy and Me. And if you want to partner with us in putting on this great opportunity, email Angela at harborcove.church. Number three, fun fact. Sharks can swim faster than humans, but humans can run faster than sharks. Therefore, in a triathlon, it would come down to which one of us is the better cyclist. And those are the three things you need to know this week. If you have any questions, visit harborcove.church. Have you ever missed something that was right in front of you? Like it was so obvious and you still didn't see it? This is a picture of uh, an outlook that we were at in Mammoth Lakes this summer on our big summer vacation. And it's just beautiful and we're looking out there. We're probably standing there for 10 minutes before we realized there was a deer right in front of us. See if you can see it. Now, conversely, a couple weeks ago, there was a bear lying next to the retention pond in our neighborhood. You can see him here and that we couldn't miss. But we don't always see what's in front of us. Maybe it's because we're not expecting it to be there or maybe because we aren't looking too hard or we're distracted by something else. Some things are too important to miss and we need to make sure to see them. And Jesus is going to talk about some of those things in the passage we're going to look at this morning. Matthew chapter 11 verses 20 through 24. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. What in the world is going on here? This is not warm, fuzzy Jesus. This is disappointed and frustrated Jesus, which is always a little bit jarring because we don't expect Jesus to be disappointed or frustrated or irritated. Now, we've been in the Gospel of Matthew for a while, basically since last April. And honestly, as we have walked through there, I think we've all discovered that there's more stuff about accountability and judgment than we would have thought before. And that doesn't seem really Jesus-y either. I mean, isn't Jesus just supposed to be okay with everything that we do? But what we're discovering is it's more like, here's the way that will bring you life. You've seen it, you know it, you've experienced it, don't ignore it. Because there will come a day of accountability. In other words, what we do matters. And how we portray the Jesus that we say we know, that matters too. And one day, we'll be held accountable for what we did and what we said. And in the meantime, what we do and say is going to affect how other people view Jesus. So it's pretty important. So we have this pretty jarring and uncomfortable passage. Let's deal with a couple of elements about it. First of all, What's the deal with these towns? Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. You've probably maybe heard of Capernaum. Maybe the others, you have no idea what those are. But they aren't just three random towns. So if you can look at the map, you can see that they are on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, Capernaum is pretty much center. Chorazin's just up the road, basically up the hill. And Bethsaida's a mile or two to the right, actually in a different country, but it, it's that close. These towns are important because this is Jesus' home turf. Capernaum is where Jesus lives. He moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. He lives there. And the other two are close enough that, you know, they're like the burbs. People would have seen each other all of the time. And Bethsaida, which is just around the lake, is actually where Peter, Andrew, and Philip 
three pretty key disciples are from. So this is a small area. It's familiar territory. And these are tight-knit communities in them among themselves, but also the three of them. It's a little bit like Gig Harbor, where you're out somewhere and you're like, oh, there's my second grade teacher. Or you're walking down the road and somebody honks and you wave because you probably know them. It was like that for Jesus. Everywhere he went in this little area, he knew people and people knew him too. And so much of what Jesus said and did was centered in this area. That's basically how the verse starts. So much of what he did was done there. And next year, a lot of us will go to this area, and I'll be able to take you to an overlook on the Golan Heights where we can look and see where all of this happened, and you'll be amazed at what a small area most of Jesus' miracles happened in. So these are important towns because it's basically Jesus' hometown. So why is Jesus upset with them? Well, Jesus, boiling it down, essentially says, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented, and Sodom would still be standing. So you've probably heard of Sodom, but what are Tyre and Sidon? Uh, Tyre and Sidon were the leading cities in the area of Phoenicia, which is the next, uh, next country over. It bordered Galilee. From where Jesus is talking, it's maybe 30 miles, maybe 50 miles to the next one, which seems like a long way, but it's half the distance that it is to go to Jerusalem. So in that day and age, people got around a little bit. Uh, a little bit. But the Phoenician cities, particularly Tyre and Sidon, were known to be for their opposition to God, for their opposition to Israel and God's people. And in the Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon are frequently denounced in the pro by the prophets because they're evil. And then Sodom. Well, Sodom is Sodom. It basically becomes the metaphor, the picture of something that was ultimately destroyed by God. But even Sodom, Sodom, if Sodom had seen the miracles that these other three cities had seen, it would still be standing. And these are cities that are widely known as being anti-God. Even them, cities and people that you would never imagine in a million years would respond to God. If they'd seen the miracles that Jesus' hometown had seen, they would have responded. But Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum didn't. So what was Jesus looking for from these cities and the people that lived in them? Well, one word, he was looking for change. They had this new piece of information. God is among them. People are being healed. Lives are being changed. Dramatic things have gone on. They can't deny what they've seen, and they don't. They just choose to ignore it or to dismiss it. And this leaves Jesus somewhat stunned. Hence the, wow, if I had done this in those other places, Jesus is looking for change. The biblical word for that is repent. And it's a great word, and we should use it more often in regular conversation, because it means to change your behavior, particularly in response to what God has done. It's like sometimes when someone does something wrong, and they apologize. And part of you is thinking, are they sorry for what they did, or are they sorry that they got caught? Because those are two very different things. What repentance does is it shows sincerity. Repentance shows that the apology, that the feeling sorry, that that was real because it involves behavior change. So let's say, heard an example of this a couple weeks ago. Let's say you cheat on a test at school and you get caught. Obviously, you feel bad. Now, if you realize that it was truly the wrong thing to do, if you recognize that you've compromised your integrity and that the teacher will never trust you in the same way again, what you can do is you can repent. And you could literally do something like go to the teacher and say, look, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have cheated on that test. I feel bad about that. I will never do that again. And to show you how serious I am about that, I'd like to sit where you can see me and my paper the entire time the next time we take a test. That's what repentance looks like. Let's say you know somebody who has a tendency to text while they drive. 
Let's use me for an example. If I got pulled over for texting while I was driving, I'd feel bad. But there's a strong chance that I'd feel bad because I got caught. Except, I was really impacted by the accident at the toll booth last week. I don't know whether you heard about that or not, but there was a couple that was stopped to pay their tolls at the Narrows toll booth. And for whatever reason, a driver behind them wasn't paying attention and had their truck on cruise control and drove into the toll plaza and realized too late that he needed to stop. And he ended up killing two people. So in response to that, I've repented from texting and driving because I saw how quickly that accident happened and how devastating it was. So I'm just not gonna do that anymore. Repentance happens when we get a new piece of information and decide to respond to it with life change. So here you have Jesus walking around healing people, changing lives, demonstrating that the God of the universe is interested in people. But these towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, keep living like nothing is different and nothing has changed. So Jesus talks about these miracles that were done in them. I mean, maybe they weren't that big of a deal. Maybe they're like the deer, you couldn't really see it. Or maybe they were like the bear and it's hard to miss. And I think it was more like the bear. So what were the miracles? Well, they're listed in a couple of places. In chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. In chapter 8, it, the whole chapter is taken up with healing. Jesus heals a demon-possessed man, he heals the centurion servant, he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then he calms the storm on the sea. In chapter 9, verse 35, got another little list. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. That's the type of thing that Jesus was doing. So let's make some notes about that. So first, what Jesus is doing is that he's demonstrating that he has come to break the power of evil and ultimately to destroy death. He heals people from some pretty spectacular conditions and some pretty mundane ones. Demon possession, which might be um, epilepsy or mental illness or could really be demon possession. I don't want to be too Western Enlightenment-y here. Um, he cures people from epilepsy. He cures people who are paralyzed. He heals people who are really, really sick. And remember, the level of medical care available is pretty much non-existent. If you got sick, a lot of people just died because there was no antibiotics, no Tylenol, no breathing treatments, not much at all. And all of these things are manifestations of the fact that the world is broken. It's not supposed to be like that. People aren't supposed to get cancer. People aren't supposed to be demon-possessed. People aren't supposed to have migraine headaches. And Jesus, in a very dramatic and effective way, steps in and reverses the evil. He heals them and he makes them the way that they were supposed to be, free of those things. Another thing that I want to make a note about this is that in that day and age, if you were sick or had something terrible befall you, like, a, like an accident where you had a compound fracture of your leg or something like that and would be lame for life, it was generally assumed that that happened because you were a bad person that you were evil and had done something wrong, or that God was mad at you. So sickness also had a stigma that was attached to them. And so it's very important that these people are brought to Jesus, broken people, hurting people, and Jesus doesn't reject them, Jesus touches them. And he shows that God isn't mad at them, that they aren't cursed, that they're still important and made in the image of God. And this is a huge part of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Hey, you have just been healed. Here's something even better. That healing happened because God has come among you and is establishing his kingdom 
where there's hope and healing and forgiveness open to everyone. So these things that Jesus is doing, it's pretty dramatic stuff. Instant life change, instant impact because of an encounter with Jesus. Demonstration that the God of the universe has stepped down into ordinary people's lives and cares about them. That's really good news. What Jesus is doing is huge, except that the people who know Jesus best miss it all. So why did they miss them? Jesus gives us one example of why. There might have been more. But right before our passage, in verses 18 and 19, he gives the reason why they're rejecting, they're rejecting him. People say that Jesus can't be the one. He can't be the Messiah because, you'll love this, he eats too much, he drinks too much, and he's always at a party with questionable company. And in response to that, Jesus says, you know, you're never going to be happy. Because John the Baptist barely ate, he didn't drink at all, he was a hermit, and you didn't approve of him either. Our passage says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He's a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Essentially, when the people that knew Jesus best looked at him, he wasn't who they thought he would be. He didn't do the things they thought he would do. He didn't act holy enough. So if Jesus wasn't what they were looking for, what were they looking for? I don't know. But whatever it was they were looking for, they didn't find it in Jesus. They had a framework for what it was going to look like, and Jesus didn't fit into the framework. Now, I kind of look at our day and age, and maybe we can draw some insight from this, because they say that in every election, people vote their pocketbooks. Maybe they're the same way. Yeah, great. I'm glad Miriam can walk again. But you know what? Taxes are due next month. When is Jesus going to do something about that? Or, hallelujah, Eliezer went back to work. For the stupid Romans, if Jesus was really the Messiah, he'd do something about that. And I wonder if it was more that type of thing. You know, bread and butter issues. Things are expensive. We don't like the Romans. Those are the issues that really need to be addressed. And they just couldn't get over Jesus hanging out at parties with the wrong kind of people. And because they had these preconceived notions about what God would look like and what God would be doing and what the right thing was, because of all that, they missed God at work among them. And I'm just really taken by that thought because a lot of what I read is about people who have tied their Christianity to some issue which to them is the key issue that they think really needs to be addressed. And maybe, just maybe, we get so focused on what we want to happen in one area or what we think something should look at, what we think something should look like, that we miss what God is actually doing. And that's what happened in Jesus' hometown. All of these amazing things happened. People's lives were being changed, and folks missed it. But I love verse 9. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What Jesus is saying is, they thought they had all these insights, but they were wrong. You can tell if a person is wise by what their actions produce. If you do stuff that's idiotic, you can't be wise. So what are some of the applications we can make from this? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to make sure that we're constantly looking for what God is doing, what God is doing here, what God is doing now. As I look around, I see a lot of anger in the church at large, especially on social media. But I don't see an angry Jesus. I see a compassionate Jesus. I don't see Jesus condemning people for being sinners. I see Jesus trying to get people to come to him so that he can heal them. Now, sometimes people hear that, you know, y'all come as it doesn't matter what you do. That's not true. That is so far from what I'm saying or what I believe. Jesus invites us to come as we are, but not to stay that way. Jesus transforms us. Jesus heals us. 
And I think we also have to be honest enough to say that it's a whole lot easier to look at other people's stuff and see what they need to change before they can come to Jesus than it is to look at ourselves. There are sins that we tolerate in this church. I could name them, but it would be very uncomfortable. What we have to remember is that inside the church, outside of the church, people who know Jesus, people who don't know Jesus yet, that we're all sinners, saved by grace, challenged to take up our cross. And by the way, what does that mean? If, I don't know what it means if it doesn't mean putting aside our prerogatives and our preferences, dying to ourselves, and being conformed to Jesus. Taking up our cross, following Jesus, and being constantly formed into his image and likeness. Because when we do that, that's when we find hope. And that, that hope, that's what we invite people to. That's the good news of the kingdom of God. I look around and I see Jesus at work all around, bringing hope and bringing healing, restoring people in spite of the economy or the political situation or the social issue of the day. I see Jesus at work everywhere. I believe that God is at work everywhere because people are still spiritual. People are deeply interested in spiritual things. People are looking for lasting hope. People are looking for peace. People are looking for something that will change their lives. And we have to be careful to make sure that we don't end up being Chorazin or Bethsaida or Capernaum. We know Jesus so well, maybe so well, that we can get lulled into a sense of knowing exactly how God is at work or should be at work. But I talk to so many people who are looking for a faithful Christian community that hasn't taken a hard right or a hard left, that isn't living in the past, that's following Jesus wherever he goes and participating in what God is doing. Why is this important in the context of these sermons? Because we need to see that God is at work and we need to accurately assess what he's doing because apparently we can miss it just like the folks in Capernaum did. So let me ask you three questions. Number one, what is one way that you see God at work in your life, your sphere of influence or your community? Number two, what is one thing that you wish Jesus would do that he doesn't seem to be doing? And number three, what is the most challenging part of following Jesus in this context for you? As we come to celebrating communion, the Lord's Supper, if maybe you accepted Jesus for the first time, this can be your first step of faith and we welcome you to this table. In fact, we, we welcome you to this table if you have faith in Jesus, even if that faith is just beginning or if it's not fully formed, you're welcome to this table. Here, my favorite call to communion. Come to the sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of his mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek his presence and pray for his spirit. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new way of doing things in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, holy and blessed forever. We are so glad that you came and entered our world. We're so glad that you were obedient to God, even dying for us on the cross, and that because of your death and resurrection, you purchased a way for us to come back to God. 
And so we come to this table where you invite us and we fully and freely confess the mistakes that we have made, the sin in our lives, the dumb things that we have said and done, knowing that just like the disciples, that you restore us, that you forgive us, and you send us back out again. God, as we come to this table, may this bread and this cup be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Whenever you're ready, won't you come to the table? Thanks again for joining us this morning. If you'd like us to get to know you a little bit more, there's a button in the chat that you can click on and fill out a contact form and we'll be in touch. And if you'd like to stay up to date on other things at Harbor Cove, you can sign up for our weekly emails at harborcove.church or you can text Harbor Cove to 55498 to sign up for text updates. 
Now here's Michael with the benediction. People of God, the thing that I pray for you this week is peace. May you know the deep peace of God that passes all understanding. May it guard your hearts and your minds, and may you dwell in it throughout the week. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.